all of that space, that vast gulf, unimaginably deep, exists. It abides. It's here around us right now. It's vertiginous, as in dizzying. Now, economic laws of supply and demand say that the more rare something is, the more precious it is. In all of that space, there's only one of you. There are many like you, but no one precisely like you. So that is one way to argue for the value of each human life using simple laws of supply and demand. Each of us is unique in all of space. One of the things you'll find when you leave home and go to the military or go to college or go out to work somewhere or to travel is you'll meet people that remind you of folks back home. You'll meet people that seem very much like some of the friends you left behind. What's fun is getting them together. There may come a point where you can actually introduce your new friends to your old friends. And if you've been smart enough not to tell the people who they remind each other of, you can see how they interact. If you tell them, hey, you remind me a lot of each other, even though you're in Maine and you're in Idaho, uh, you guys, when you meet, are going to be trying to show how different you are, just subconsciously, because we're all unique. But if you don't tell them, if you just watch and see how they interact, it can be kind of interesting. But they're not the same. Everyone is unique. And that's just the dimension of space. Now let's take into account time. Ah, time. Time, that extra dimension. Length, width, height, depth, time, height. Something's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. There it happened. It's gone now, it's in the past. We barely perceive time. Time is at the literal edge of our ability to understand. The present slips through our fingers. Like trying to hold on to water with a wide-fingered stance grip. You can't do it. It moves. It's elusive. Now, we do have memory, which helps us to connect with the past, to stay grounded in it. And we are probably, well, at least possibly, the only creatures on Earth that know we're going to die. Yep, you and I, at some point, are going to die. And everyone and everything that we know also will die. There'll come a point where no one will remember what that flag represents. Uh, there'll come a point where no one will understand any of the words that you take for granted. Because we're mortal, we're finite beings. We come, we uh, live we die, and we're gone. And maybe we're remembered, and maybe we're not. I understand that can be a kind of depressing thought. Frank Herbert, the author, once said that the beginning of wisdom is to appreciate your own mortality. The end of, the, end, uh, the, the beginning of, the beginning of fear is to appreciate your own mortality. The end of fear is to understand its inevitability. We will die. That's normal. That's natural. If you try to stop it, you leave the normal world and enter the world of comic book villainy. Comic book villainy. You don't want to be there. Because <laughs> a man who has to work that hard at laughing is not really having fun. He's showing off a little bit too much. In the eternity of time, from creation till the end of things, the person that sits in front of me is unique. You are different from who you were last year, this time. In nine months after you're done with a year of me, you're going to be different. Now, maybe some of the things I teach you will stick with you. Maybe they won't. That's up to us. But you're going to be a different person. A year from now, you'll be a different person. Five years ago, who were you? Leaving childhood, entering adolescence. Five years from now. Who will you be? A decade ago, you were children, small children. A decade from now, you will be young adults. You will have left the shallows of your childhood, and you will be swimming the deep waters of adulthood. Scary, predator-filled deep waters. 
you will be different. God, I hope so. What's weird is the status of teenager. It's unnatural. Most societies throughout history don't have teenagers. All of you would be adults. Some of you would be married. If you're not, you'd be married soon. You'd have children, many of you. You'd have jobs. And you would have the opportunities of freedom that adults in that given time and place would have had. And the responsibilities. You'd be on the young side. Trust me, the older men would kick the butts of the younger men. Why? Put them in their place. Once that happens, they'd invite the younger man to join them with respect. Women have different ways. They're sort of more talky and devious and backbitey, but it, it works too. You would all be adults. Right now, you're in this weird teenage realm. That's only because our society is so bleeping complex that you need more time to learn the skills you need to swim the seas of adulthood. You are unique in this moment, as you are unique in all of the space. And there is a preciousness and a value of that. We don't even appreciate time in a normal way. We have our own context. We have our own subjective way of appreciating time. Again and again, they've done studies of um, time. For example, let's say you've got a building that you want to collapse into its own basement hole. So, demolitions experts plant charges and evacuate the area and the area around the area just in case. And if everything goes right, when they hit the button, the charges will go off very quickly but in a certain order in such a way as to collapse the building into its basement hole. Sometimes scientists have placed remote cameras with radios on them to see what happens. In the microseconds between detonation and the rupturing of the bomb's metal case, at that moment, birds begin to leap into the air off the roof. Now, there's no light passing because the charges are inside closed off spaces. So they don't see a flash. There's no pressure wave. There's no sound. It hasn't reached them yet. Human science can't explain it any more than human science can explain how a bumble bumblebee flies. Bumblebees, according to our aerodynamic science, are incapable of flight. And yet, bzz, they're beyond our understanding. We don't know why, but birds have this sense. We do know that birds live a very compressed life. A hummingbird bzz, lives a very short life, very intensely. They perceive time differently. To a bird, kind of slow-like. They live a much faster pace. Turtles, on the other hand, live a slower pace. They have slower biorhythm, slower heartbeat, slower respiration rate. They can't see rain. They can see the water level going up. They can feel that they need to swim now instead of walk. But they can't see rain. Rain happens too quickly for their eyes to capture I guess what I'm saying is, don't tell me what's normal. We have no freaking clue what's normal. You and I have the experiences that our bodies have lived, added to the experiences that we get vicariously by reading books, watching movies, and playing computer games. That's what we know. It's not enough. It's never enough. This is why I don't believe in socialism. I think it's nonsense. And you're going to hear a lot more of my beliefs, and you can tell me your beliefs, especially if you think I'm wrong. I, I like the discussion. But socialism presumes that human be beings can figure out how to run the economy in a way that's humane. <laughs> oh, gosh. It doesn't work. Ever. Because I've never met a human being with the perspective of God. They, the leaders of socialist countries, don't have any greater understanding than we do. What we do have is what we have. The Spanish philosopher Jose Ortega y Gasset once said, you are yourself plus your circumstances. Yourself is your personality, your likes, your dislikes, your personal memories, all of that, your values, that's your you. 
the yourself he's talking about is your context, the years you've lived, the experiences that come before you, the things that lead us to speak the English language, to have Western Judeo-Christian civilization here in northern Idaho. The things that lead people in the world to want to slit your throats and mine just because you're American. These are people who don't know you. You've never personally done anything to them. So why would they happily kill you? Why, if you were in Afghanistan facing the Taliban, would you basically be measuring your future in minutes rather than years or decades? Because you're Americans. And that means you have a cultural identity that matters. It shapes who and what you are. It's why you speak English. It's why you wear the clothing you have. It's why you are in a society that believes in freedom. And America has a history of stepping up against evil. There's another thing. Evil exists. It's not, oh, does evil exist? Let's have a philosophy. No! I don't study philosophy. I study history. History is the long catalog of human crime, of the evil that men do to one another. That's what I teach. And I've also, I'm also old enough to have encountered evil personally. When you do, you'll know it. The hackles on the back of your neck will stand right up. Evil exists. And America has chosen again and again, for reasons that I agree with, you may not, to involve ourselves in fights against evil, against Islamo-fascism, against communism, against national socialism, against fascism, against Japanese and German imperialism, we get involved. And so people love us or hate us. And some people love us. There are people in this world that would treat you very well because you're an American, because their freedom exists because of our ancestors. I'm going to introduce you to all that. Now, you may decide that you love America, my culture, love it or leave it. I love Western civilization. That's fine. Or you may decide eh, we're defined by slavery, and colonialism, and the poor indigenous peoples, peoples, peoples. Fine, you can decide that. But you're going to make your arguments in English. And you're going to make your arguments using Western lingo about human rights and values. In other words, whether you want to defend and perpetuate Western civilization into the future, or whether you want to criticize it and change it and make it more perfect in your mind, you're still of the culture. You're still part of the civilization. So from the creation of the universe till the end of uh, the Middle Ages, I'll be teaching you about ancient and medieval history. The end of the Middle Ages comes with the fall of the final Roman capital in the east, the city of Constantinople in 1453, falls to Islamic Turkish cannons. A few years later, in 1492, Christopher Columbus discovers the Americas for Europe. Those two events change the world. We'll be talking about everything from creation to them. And next year in European history, and you'll either have me or someone, Mr. Burfind, our new teacher, and you will learn about the last 500 years. So, that's the beginning. Lesson on scale. Now, in a moment, what I'm going to do is call you up alphabetically by last name. When you come up here, you will please, from this pile, take from top to bottom. When this pile is gone, then go to this pile, top to bottom. I'm sort of setting, sending, handing these out in numerical order. After you do that, you will then come over here and you will take the note pack for the first quarter, the syllabus and class policies, a case study packet, a bunch of chapter survey question sheets, and a chapter survey or two. So be ready to do that. We will start in the order I say it, Mr. Aliano, Ms. Auten, Ms. Brinson, Ms. Bunger, Bunger sorry. and Ms. Dallin. Come on over. Okay, you have number 1641. Got it. Thank you, sir. Zero four one. Okay. You are Ms. Hoffman. Okay, you got sixteen zero fourteen. Thank you. You are Ms. Brinson. Okay. Let's get sixteen zero four three. Please don't forget your papers. Sixteen, and you are Miss Bung Bung Bunger. 
16045. Okay, now we have Mr. Cartel, Ms. Jaylee, Mr. Johnson, uh, Mr. Jones, and Mr. Klein. In that order. Okay, Mr. Hartel? 046. Got it. Thank you, sir. Ms. Jaylee? 16047. Thank you. Mr. Johnson? Okay, hold on. I want to do Johnson first. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. 16049. Got it. Okay, you got 16048, Mr. Johnson. And Mr. Klein, see the bottom edge, down here, 16050. You try to be here a little bit. Okay, uh, Ms. Marion, Mr. McGoy, Ms. Mowry, Mr. Dooley, Mr. O'Callaghan. At the end of this, I'll ask if for whatever reason I didn't call you, and at that point you can come up. So, Ms. Marion, do you? Mr. McGoy? Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Muley, the 16052. How do you say it? Okay, do I have Ms. Mowry? Okay. 16. Let me see the bottom. 16054. Don't forget your papers. And 16055. Okay. Mr. Omas, Ms. Oxford, Ms. Uh, Pierwitz, uh, Ms. Rader, Mr. So. In that order. Mr. Omas? 16056. Got it. Uh, Ms. Oxford? Okay, 16056. Is there a Devin Pierwitz here? No, she isn't. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is Mr. Saw, 16058. And you are Ms. Rader? 16059. Got it, thank you. Okay, Mr. Sharp, Ms. Scalak, or Scalak, uh, Mr. Strait, Ms. Strom, Ms. Sutton, in that order. Mr. Sharp? Thank you. Thank you. How do you say it? Okay. 16, what is it? 0, 61. Uh, Mr. Strait. Bottom edge. 0, 61. Mr. Strait. Okay. 16063. Is Madeline Strong here? No. Yes. Okay. Uh, finally, Mr. Volus, Ms. Wallets, Mr. Wright, and Ms. Bird. Okay. Raphael, thank you. Okay, you are Miss Wallace. Sixteen zero sixty six. And thank you. All right. Okay, so you are okay. Okay, now I'm going to give you a bit of a tour of the room. Oh, actually, before I do that, bring your textbook home. Bring it where you work, at home. Leave it there, at home. You will never, I'll say that again, never need your textbook in my class. Bring it home, leave it there, it's for homework. Do it at home. If for whatever reason you choose to ignore my uh, request and bring it around, 
After a week from today, it will be covered. These are relatively new books. I want to keep them in good order. So if I see them and they are not covered, it will be a matter of discipline after a week from today. Please get them covered if you're going to keep them in school. But honestly, I don't know why you would. You don't need them here. Do them at, or at home. Now, if you want to come in and do some work during study lab, I have classroom books that you can use in class. You just can't take them out of here. So there's never really a reason. Just bring the books home. The papers, on the other hand, you will need every day. So keep them with your notebook. My basic standard is if I or someone else is in front of the classroom, you will have something to write on and something to write with. We'll go over those details a little later. For today, I'm a little open on it, but after today, you'll have something in your hands to write with and something in front of you, probably your notes packet, to write on. Okay, let's look at the classroom. I expect that the, after uh, we are done and diverge from European history, ancient history notes will typically be on this board. Film, uh, projector screen, a bunch of maps. You'll notice on the upper perimeter of the walls a group of quotes. I think they're interesting. They're also an opportunity for extra credit. Once per quarter, you may take one of these quotes, write it down on a piece of paper, then rewrite it in your own words. Then spend uh, three quarters of a page to a page explaining why you agree or disagree with the quote. You do that, you get an extra credit homework grade for the quarter. Very, very, very easy. Here we have a geographical map of Europe, the Near East, the Middle East, and even into Central Asia, which we'll use for certain lessons. That bearded fellow in the statue is named Lucius Verus. He was a mediocre emperor at the height of the Roman Empire in the Pax Romana of the 2nd century AD. I have it there because it is a high point of the sculptor's art. The hair feels fluffy. If you encounter this statue in person, it looks fluffy. To do that with marble is an amazing thing. This is the Hereford map. A thousand years ago, it was made in an Anglo-Saxon monastery. What it shows, actually closer to 1100 years ago now, is it's, it's, it's sort of what's called a TO map. In the center is Jerusalem. Holy city. You've got the horizontal part of the T, the Black Sea, and the Nile River. The vertical part of the T is the Mediterranean Sea. And the world is a disc. It's rounded, but it's flat. It's a disc. And around the outer edge of the disc is the river ocean, that watery area at the edge of the world before you fall off. We'll talk about more of these later. This we'll talk about now. I told you, evil exists. To me, one of the greatest evils is communism. In 1949, communists took over China. In 1989, communist regimes were falling in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, and there were people in China just my age, just gotten out of college, were still in college, who were wanting freedom for China. So in the spring of 1989, they go to the capital city of China, Beijing, to the biggest open-air plaza, Tiananmen Square, the Plaza of Heavenly Peace. And they began protesting against corruption in the Communist Party, and then eventually for freedom. They build an effigy of the, of the Statue of Liberty. They call it the Goddess of Democracy. The world's press goes to Beijing to see this amazing thing, these students trying to turn communism into a free society. But the communist leaders then and now don't want to leave. They don't want to give up power. So they decide they need to send in the troops to, to kill some folk, to remind everyone of who the boss is. But they can't even trust their own army. Most of the army is sympathetic to the protesters. What they have to do is find the most backwoods, countrified folk army units in their army. Because in China, there's a long history of hatred between the city folk and the country folk. City folk think the country folk are animals in human form. They're only good for growing food. They go to the bathroom wherever they are. They're yeah, disgusting. And the people in the country think the people in the city look down on them, which they do. So 
units of the Communist uh, People's Liberation Army are cherry-picked because of their large number of country folk who are willing to kill city folk anytime they can. So they gather on the night of June 3rd, 4th, 1989, and around uh, 1 a.m. they begin rolling towards Tiananmen Square. They're going to converge there just before dawn. The international media is taken away from anywhere within eyesight of Tiananmen Square. They're taken to a hotel several blocks away that faces away from the square, and they are kept off the side of the building, away from the side of the building that has windows or balconies facing Tiananmen Square. Okay, pre-dawn light. A man carrying a cardboard briefcase and a plastic lunch bag is on his way to his job and uh, wearing polyester plant pants and shirt, cheapo cardboard belt. And he hears the tanks. You hear tanks before you see them. Tanks are incredibly loud. And then he sees the tanks trundling down the street towards a corner that he's about to cross, or that he's just crossed. And something inside him changes. I can't describe it. When he steps off the curb into the street as the tanks approach, he knows he's never going to see his wife or children again. He's never going to get to go home again. He's never going to have a drink or have a meal or a laugh with friends. That's all done. Because he steps in front of the tank and shouts, Stop! Don't do this! These are not enemies. These are our own young. They're our future. They may be misguided, silly college kids. That's what college kids are. Don't kill them. They're not enemies. Stop! <laughs> what nobody knew at first was that on one of the balconies, there were photographers and journalists, and one of the journalists had a video camera and a satellite uplink. This was broadcast live on international television. I saw it happen live back when CNN was still a reputable news service. I watched this guy step in front of the tanks and they stop. He continues to try to persuade that these, these guys on the tanks. Now notice the tanks have no foot soldiers. Tanks without infantry are very vulnerable. The reason there are no foot soldiers is because the communists couldn't trust the army enough to have enough soldiers to accompany their tanks. The Chinese were short of manpower because they couldn't be trusted to murder their own people. Well, the tanks stopped because in a communist police state, you don't do anything on your own initiative. They radioed for orders from the higher-ups. And the higher-ups, by the time they were ready to give those orders, saw on international television this thing playing out. So they said, Psh, go around. So the tanks back up, and they try to go around him. Now, most people would say, okay, mischief managed, problem solved, I'm done. I'm going to go to work now. Stop! Don't do this! He gets in front of the tanks again. For the next almost five minutes, this man steps in front of, stopping tank after tank after tank. And I've never seen anything like it in my life. Then the PSB, the Chinese Communist Gestapo, show up in the journalist's hotel. And they move the journalists away from all the windows. Only when they are sure that there are no cameras on that street corner do things get resolved. For the next, well, the tanks and the troops converge at Tiananmen Square. They're bayoneted, they're machine gunned, they're shot, they're run over with tanks. And those are the lucky ones. The unlucky ones are arrested, put in prison, tortured, and put on show trials. In China, if you're put on trial, you have a 99% chance of being convicted. In other words, the attitude is you wouldn't be in a courtroom if you weren't guilty. In other words, accus accusation equals guilt. You don't want a 99% conviction rate in courts. It indicates that the courts always find people guilty, which isn't just. They're all found guilty. They're fattened up the last two weeks of their life. They're shot in the back of the head with a single bullet. Their family is mailed 
the bill for the price of the bullet, and then their organs are sold for profit on the international black market. That's the way it's done in communist China. In some ways, it's just easier to just get shot and have done with it. It was two weeks, more than two weeks, before any photography or camera work was done at that street corner. When it was, there was a small smear on the pavement. What's clear that happened is after the cameras were away, the tanks ran over him, one after the other after the other, until he wasn't even a jelly. He was a faint stain on the pavement. Now, you might say, well, he failed. And he did, up till now. The same blood-stained people that were in charge then are, well, their, their successors are in charge now. China's still a totalitarian communist police state. But I'll tell you, every good thing that we have in this world, our freedom, the technology that makes our lives so interesting and so comfortable, the belief that you have a right to your own opinions, that all came because at some point in the past, someone was willing to step from safety into danger, from obscurity into history, and say, stop, I've got a better idea. Stop, we're doing this wrong. And the world, look, there was a historical guy named Yeshua Bar Joseph of Nazareth. In other words, Jesus existed. Whether you believe he's the son of God or not, that's a matter of faith. But he was a historical fellow. And he did preach what was wrong with the world and the solution, which was love. And the world responded by crucifying him. The world does not want to hear from anyone, I've got a better idea. If you have a better idea, if you are a critic, you're probably going to be hurt, stepped on. It's the price of progress. But without the courage of everyday people, we would have no progress. We'd still live in caves. We'd still be under the tyrannical rule of kings. I have his picture up there because he's probably one of the most courageous men I've ever known. And I only knew him through the cameras. And because someday China will be free. And when China is free, they'll see him as a man who showed the way. Anyway, that's why I have that up there. There's my desk. You'll see a bunch of books in here. Military history, art, and general history, various periods that we study. Um, if you want, you can come in during study lab, get a pass, and you can use them for research. And uh, if you want to take them out, you, you can come to me and ask. And I will usually sign them out to you. I don't sign out encyclopedias, but almost everything else I'm willing to. The only deal is this. If you sign out one of my books, you return it in the same condition you got it. If you do, no problem. If you don't, you owe me the price for a replacement uh, so that I keep my collection up. Okay, this is period four. This, over here, is the period four shelf. This is where all of your work goes. Whenever you have a homework assignment, put it here. Don't give it to me. Don't keep it. On the due date, you turn it in right here. That's where all work goes. If there's something weird going on, I'll tell you. I've got here staplers, tape, three hole punches that you can use, pencil sharpeners. Uh, let's see. And I'll go over this stuff later. Ah, here's the ancient and medieval uh, syllabus. You should keep your own copy, but if you're curious, I have, I've posted it. Here's the fire alarm. Ah, the bathroom pass. This is the bathroom pass. This bathroom pass, if it's here, you don't have to ever ask me to use the facilities or anything like that. It's not big. If the pass is here, come over and sign it out. Put the date, your name, BR for bathroom, if that's where you're going, time out, and when you come back, time in. When you come back, return out. And if you see this pass here, you can just pick it up, sign out, and go. Come back. No harm, no foul. If there's going to be an emergency, let me know on your way out. Uh, and that usually doesn't happen. So in general terms, sign out the pass. Here are the evacuation maps. Here's a trauma kit. Here's our fire extinguisher. Pencil sharpener, clock, our flag, and a bunch of men who I think uh, helped save the world. And I'll talk about them. 
Up top here, you will see the homework board where I usually post upcoming assignments. It's coming uh, a week from tomorrow. You've got class policy signatures, obsession, movie worksheet signatures, and a short essay or two on terrorism. We'll talk about those later. In the center, you see the fluid and the wipes. If you want to clean your area for COVID before you sit down, you can come over here, spray the fluid on your area, use the wipes, and then put them back for somebody else to. It's your responsibility. You want to do it? Do it. You don't want to do it? Don't do it. Um, I think that's it for the tour. Now, in a moment, what we're going to do is an evacuation drill so that you know how it works. We'll be back for those of you at home.